Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. I got my buddy Jim Dexter. Jim, I kick your cold a little bit. A little bit. A little we, chilly. We've talked about doing this for like a year. We have. You've uh, you've been busy. I've been busy. Worked out today. Glad that you made it out. Uh, Jim is a police officer here in suburban Chicago land. You are former federal law enforcement officer. You're an air marshal, right? I was. That's correct. Uh, and then right now you currently serve on the board of our state's tactical officers association. I do. Most people don't, if they don't know, many states, I think probably all of them, in some capacity, have a tactical officers association, which is a private entity. Basically, it's a collective of agencies. They put people out there and they look for uh, training material, uh, for new cutting edge stuff that they can take from the collective and pass on to agencies. Is that a better or a good way of describing Mm -hmm. it? So you're uh, on their board. I've known a few guys over the years that have done that. That's super cool because it's totally volunteer. It is. Yeah, it's completely volunteer. Mm -hmm. So you and I chatted this morning, and this is what we wanted to talk about. A shooting happened here in our home state of Illinois in a pretty rough neighborhood. Uh, Was it it last night or the night before? Uh, I think it was the overnight hours of the night before. Okay. And today is the 13th of November, right? So it was a couple nights ago. And what had happened, I'll paint the picture and then you and I will chat about it, you more so than I. A local bar full of people, a drunk gentleman's asked to leave. Drunk gentleman leaves, comes back with a gun, starts shooting the place up, right? So the uh, security guard on scene is a legally uh, uh, armed concealed carry person. There's some that's kind of a sketchy area. I don't know if, if we found out yet, like if he was, if he had a tan card and perk card and all that stuff, was he working? I don't have, I don't have yeah. specific details. So like in the state of Illinois, to be armed in a place that sells alcohol as 50% or more of their uh, uh, income, you need to be there in the capacity as a security guard that's licensed to do so. So we don't know if he was or not, or if he was just like a security dude that had a concealed carry. But the long and the short of it was he went to... Uh, the aid of the, the public there got the uh, uh, attacker, the, the shooter, on the ground. At the same time, local police show up, county police, and I'll let you take over. So as the police arrived on scene, the information that they had was that it was an active shooter situation. The details that are out right now are that there were injured persons inside the bar. The police... Uh, located those injured persons and then eventually were led to an area uh, in which they observed an armed subject uh, around a group of people and an officer officer subsequently utilized deadly force against uh, against that armed individual so here's the problem the media pumps out partial accounts of information and what the mass public is told by the media what the mass public chooses to believe because they only dig so far is a security guard was murdered by the police. When in reality, what had happened was an armed subject didn't obey a police command is what it sounds like, and unfortunately, terribly, was shot. So we're not here today to discuss the total ins and outs of that because that will have its day in court. All the facts of that will come to bear. But what we want to make sure people understand, all of you guys, from Instagram to YouTube to wherever you guys are listening, is post, I guess we could talk pre and post engagement. So much time is spent, especially if you're you're, uh, focused on the art of the gun or the actual combative application, we forget about what do we do before and after. Before meaning, can I run away? Can I hide? Can I call for help? Can I I de-escalate the situation? And then after, do I need to sit here and hold this guy at gunpoint? Can I tell people I'm wearing a black shirt when the police officers get here? Make sure they know this guy in this shirt with the sweet salt and pepper hair and the dashingly handsome good looks is the good guy? That was a joke, anyway, by the way. So, 101, post-engagement. What, like, 
where does somebody start in that journey of training? So the first part in the post engagement sequence in that journey is realizing that the post engagement sequence isn't just this. Right. Uh, everybody <laughs> says, all right, do, do, do your post engagement sequence. And on a flat range or in a training event, it's easy to do that and then you stop the drill. Um, but that's not when your post engagement sequence ends. Sequence ends. Um, in a real life, real world shooting, your sequence of events isn't over until the police have arrived to deal with whatever you had to handle, whatever mm -hmm. you had to deal with. So, so this idea that your post-engagement sequence is just your, your scan and assess or whatever you're going to do and then look back downrange needs to be expanded further, mm -hmm. uh, especially in your mind and your preparation and your recognition that you've just discharged a firearm. Somebody else is coming. Sure. Uh, the, the, the police have been summoned. They should have been summoned. They're, they're likely on their way. Uh, and you can't always be sure what information the police have. Uh, first off, I'll, I'll tell you that as a law enforcement officer, uh, the information that we get isn't always the best. Sure. Um, it's you've, got, you've got scared people calling 911. Multiple people calling What's he look like? I don't know. They're taking 13, 14 different phone calls, and mm -hmm. they're feeding us pieces of information. It may be from different sources. There may be conflicting pieces of information, uh, but, but the police are on their way. Somebody is always eventually going to come. Let me interject here, too. This, could, this is all true for a police officer. This isn't just the armed non-police officer, so you might be the only guy on scene. We talked today, an unarmed, or not an unarmed, but an off-duty, plain clothes officer, or, or even a completely uh, uniformed officer has these same issues, right? Correct, yeah, absolutely. When, when you look at plain clothes law enforcement officers and the amount of times that plain clothes officers are shot by the police, um, it, it's a high number mm. because it's the, it's the same context, it's the same situation in that you have someone who is dressed similar to everyone else uh, because they were, you know, in this instance, uh, they were they were at a bar and so everybody kind of looks the same. Uh, what's the, what's a bad guy look like? Red here, you know, beard. you know. Uh, if you'd have seen me this morning before I got trimmed up a little bit yeah, more, he I look, I look more like a bad guy, like than, a homeless than, guy. than I than I do now. But a homeless hillbilly. <laughs> when you look at the settings of things, especially, you know, you look at this this recent shooting at the California bar um, out, out west, and what does a bad guy look like? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be anybody in the crowd who all of a sudden decides to to do harm. To two other people, minus your bank robbery where the guy's wearing a ski mask. Right. The recognition between who is a good guy and who is a bad guy, um, you know, in, in a fast, dynamically moving situation in which the law enforcement's response, especially to an active shooter situation, is our number one priority is to immediately stop the loss of life. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, you've got to, you've got to analyze a huge swath of information in a very compressed amount of time. And I think the point that everybody listening needs to take away is if you're on a scene, be it a car accident, a fire, or some type of violence, the information you provide the 911 dispatcher is your information when you roll up. It or, is. And that's it. Because you yeah. don't know. You don't magically know. Yeah. It's not like there's some earbud where there's like it's not like the movies where there's drones right. everywhere telling you three-dimensional you know th and, it's not, it's not, and it's not tv right you know it's not tv where where i run up and and the good guy has put the bad guy down and he's just kind of given a thumbs up and everybody runs up and knows and knows what's going on right uh, you know there, there's that recognition that that it's a dynamic event there's stress involved for both parties involved um, and and so as we arrive on scene we're looking for a threat we're looking for somebody who has the capacity to actively continue to kill people and our goal is to stop that person so there needs to be the idea in people's heads as they use deadly force or mm -hmm. they use force against another person that they need to then be able to show when the police arrive that they are not in fact an aggressor uh, that they are not attempting to do people further harm uh, and, and they need to have that in their minds that at some point there's going to be some sort of challenge from law enforcement when they arrive, or some sort of challenge from a possibly another armed citizen, which happens all the time. Who is on too. location? Exactly. We who talk is on about location. that in classes often. How, same scenario you're talking about. It's that this stuff happens every couple months. You hear the story of a good guy intervening, another good guy. All they know is 
I mean, think about this, guys. If you're out and about and you see some gunfire and there's some dude that's dressed like us shooting somebody, how the hell do you know who was the murderer and who was the, the, the hero or uh, uh, the, the person trying to mitigate danger? Yes. Yeah, One of the issues, too, is that as people, as people look at these events and, and try to pick them apart, is that they look at finite or individual details within the entire incident, the entire Without event. The totality. And they don't, exactly. They don't look at the totality of the circumstances in, in the entire thing. And I think that it's easy as an armed citizen in your thought process of, of dealing with a violent encounter to look at it very singularly as well and mm -hmm. not think about yourself in the totality of the circumstances. Uh, I know I'm a good guy. Uh, I know that when I draw my firearm and discharge it, it's for good intentions and it's to save other people's lives. Uh, do other people coming in know that? Uh, what am I doing to show that? Am I prepared? Am I, am I knowing that the next thing that's going to happen now is that I am going to receive challenge from somebody else. And so what do you mean so people understand receive challenge? So let's just paint the picture. I am the good guy with the gun at one of these terrible bar shootings. I've stopped the bad guy. Uh, chaos is all around. Mm -hmm. Police have been called. You show up and I've got two bad guys on the ground. I'm drenched in sweat. I'm scared out of my mind because I just had to shoot these people. What's it? How does that play out? So, so really, when, when you break down, the first level of challenge is simply a uniform law enforcement officer's presence. Uh, at that point, as soon as the police arrive, whether it be that you hear a siren pull up, that you see a, a, a law enforcement officer, a, a uniform law enforcement officer, somebody who is clearly there to look for the bad guy, that's really, you have to think of it as your first challenge, is that uniform law enforcement is now here. Mm -hmm. and, and what we are doing is we are looking for the person with the gun or the person with whatever weapon it may be who is attempting to do people harm. Because our number one responsibility is to stop that active killer. Right. If I arrive on the scene of, an, of a shooting incident and there was shooting going on and I identified that there were shooting victims at this scene, I am looking for a person with a gun, uh, plain and simple. Barring any other outside information of, of description or, or anything like that, I'm looking for a person with a gun. Uh, and at that point, the first challenge then for an armed encounter is simply the presence of law enforcement. And that's when you really need to kick into your mind that I need to do something to distinguish myself from a bad guy with a gun. Because at that point, who's a good guy and who's a bad guy we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, all we know is that there was some sort of shooting that occurred and that we need to stop further shooting to, to defend the loss, the loss of life. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I think that first challenge, uh, while not an active challenge, simple presence alone uh, is, is a challenge to an armed person. Uh, you know that, that the police are there. You know that they're seeking out someone who is attempting to do other people harm. And that's where I think people really need to, to think in their head uh, outside of themselves and their personal interest in the incident. I know I'm a good guy. I, I hear or I hear or I see a lot, you know, on the internet. Well, well, I know I'm a good guy. I'm not I'm not putting my gun down. I just I just shot this this bad guy. Okay, um you, you may have just done that. That's that's all well and good. You know that, but who else knows that? Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, um does it matter if you were right that you were the good guy? Or does it matter that, that you were possibly perceived as a threat? Right. Because you maybe didn't think a step further to take specific action to ensure that you did not appear that you were the threat to, right to the public and those around you. Right on. And that's the, that I think is that specific instance of assuming that we even have this time frame to have discussions, right? Like we, we, we train sometimes for very specific instances that may or may not happen. So in this instance, maybe, you, maybe you're the only one there and police aren't coming or you don't know if they're coming. Maybe you didn't have a chance to communicate with the dispatcher. Maybe there's 40 people at the mall that all called the cops. So you have no idea what each of those individual people. I bring this up because we can't assume one law enforcement is made of the same flesh and blood as the rest of the world. So they have the same responses to adrenaline and, and high levels of stress. You and I talked about this earlier, even highly trained, even highly trained big city police agencies oftentimes are very untested. 
Because even though the news tells us that these things happen every day, in reality, they're actually very Correct. few and far between. Uh, most cops go their whole career and never shoot anybody, thankfully. So we assume, though, as a general public, that these guys have some extra power to be able to discern right from wrong, good from evil. So I only bring that up because you have to put yourself in the position of what would I do as a normal, lawful, law-abiding person? Kind of the same metric that we use when we, the, the, the uh, uh, reasonable man doctrine, being able to articulate our, our actions. Are your actions standing there as the cops pull in? Are they the actions that a reasonable person would do? Hey, put the gun down. Screw you, man. It's my Second Amendment right yeah. to hold on exactly. to this thing. Yeah. Now yeah. wait a second. So, yeah. so now they shot you, yeah. and and then when everybody says, "Well, the cops told him put the gun down, but he didn't listen," would a reasonable person not put their gun down when a law enforcement officer? And you get some folks that take the stance of "Screw that," and their rights don't trump mine. True. Except we, the people, empower police officers to protect us from evil. So they're just doing their job. It's kind of the yeah, you know, and, and I'm certainly here not not here to make excuses for for the police. Um, you know, I I am a I am a police officer. Um, I'm also a citizen. Uh, you know, and, and I expect the the level of professionalism, training, uh, composure, and activity from the police uh, that serve my family as and my coworkers, you know, as I do just as anybody else. Sure. Because at the end of the day, I spend more of my life not in uniform as the police, interacting as a citizen who may need to rely on trained, educated, and, and proper police officers than I do actually being the police uh, myself. You know, one of the things being on the board of the Tactical Officers Association is highlighting deficiencies in training and, and making those areas stronger mm -hmm. uh, and, and really pushing that out to the police to have the most highly trained police force that, that we can possibly have. Uh, part of that is use of force and force on force training and judgment based shooting. Uh, but, but I think that one of the things that we need to do is that there needs to be a middle ground between the idea of force on force and judgment based shooting with the police and armed citizens and their recognition in playing a part in ensuring that there isn't an incorrect uh, application of force. Because mm -hmm. let's be clear, uh, if we arrive on scene and there is an active shooting going on and we see somebody with a gun and go so far as to issue a verbal challenge, uh, the, the, the next part of kind of the challenge in, in an armed encounter, we issue a verbal challenge, drop the gun, drop the gun and you don't immediately do that, um, we are going to use force. Because again, our number one responsibility when we arrive on scene is to stop the further loss of life. Mm -hmm. And so our presence, we are now there. We have arrived with sirens in squad cars. Uh, we're, we're in uniform. Uh, we may have long guns uh, with us, a, a very clear presence. And, and it should be very obvious what we're there to do. When we take that a step further then and issue a verbal challenge, uh, we need to come in the middle between this, this use of force training that the police do in shoot no shoot situations and the education of the general armed public in, where, in what role they need to play to ensure that our use of force is proper. Sure. Uh, because while, again, while you may be right, at the end of the day, if I don't see or the police don't see that you are the one who was right in that situation, and you get shot, what good did it do mm -hmm. for you to have been right? We're judged by our actions, and if our actions would lead, for example, calling fire in a dark theater, why would you do that? When everybody gets up and stampedes out of the theater, why would you assume they wouldn't? So, like, it just seems so simple to me, simple to understand that when people, if people see this and understand your word totality of the situation, and looked at that, and again, to your point, we're not trying to brush off bad or criminal or improper behavior, but pointing a gun at you, telling you drop the gun, I'm here doing my job and you don't drop the gun, uh, you're probably going to get shot, right? You're, at the, you're, at the, yeah, you're at, probably going to get shot. At the very shot. least, yeah, at the, ver yep. at the very least, at least getting, at least getting shot once or, or more times. So verbal command being issued. 
I mean, it's, there's not tons to talk about. Obey the commands. I talk about this often and people will say to me, oh, you're a bootlicker. You're a red coat bootlicker. And it makes me, it makes me chuckle because I know cops that would that, that do the same thing. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain in a minute that my yeah. credentials are in my yeah. back pocket because I know that you know. That yeah. <laughs> so so the, 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 biggest thing with, the biggest thing with verbal commands and the obeying the verbal commands is first off the recognition that, that people need to realize in their head if they've just used force that verbal commands are probably coming. Uh, you know, I, I realize that in use of force things, you get auditory exclusion. You kind of get that tunnel vision. And so when you look at the post-engagement sequence and the things that you, you should be doing, uh, movement, commands, verbalizing things to, to get yourself breathing again and get yourself hearing more things around, there just needs to be the recognition that uh, you need to start listening to, to what's happening and what's going on mm -hmm. uh, around you uh, and, take, and take a certain level of responsibility past just shooting the gun. Mm -hmm. um, now it's time to be looking around, making sure that you hit the right guy, um, listening to what's going on around you, and again, just really engaging in your mind that somebody else is probably coming now into this situation and tuning into the next part of what's going to need to be done, and that's that handover of the situation to the police. Uh, because as far as obeying commands go, your part of this is now over. Um, you're, you're, you're done. You've stopped whatever the threat was. Um, now it's the responsibility of the police to, to come in, uh, you know, take care of the situation, render aid, apprehend those, those that are necessary, interview, uh, put together a full timeline of events for eventual prosecution mm -hmm. and a full fact-finding body of, of what occurred. Uh, and so there needs to be the recognition that then there is somebody else coming in to take over responsibility for the rest of this event. Uh, and so, you know, this idea that, you know, oh, I've got to obey orders. Well, you, yes, you have done what you said that you were going to do through all of your training, through carrying a firearm, um, through being willing to step up and mm -hmm. interject in that situation to stop the loss of life. Uh, but at the end of the day, Part of stopping that loss of life is ensuring that you live through the end of that encounter in order to get the high five from the police and the citizen's medal, you know, and, and, and all the recognition that comes with stepping up into, into, these, sort of, mm -hmm. into these sort of incidents as, as an active participant in, in saving lives. Uh, you know, but so, so part of that is the recognition that, that somebody else is coming and, and opening up your mind in that post-engagement sequence and realizing that it's not just the look over your left, the look over your right that we all practice and pretend on the I range, don't practice that you know, shit. In our, in, our, in our Instagram stuff, you know, that, that, that we do as we, as, we, as we follow down, look left, look right, and I'm like, oh yeah, boom, I'm done. There's just, there's so much more in that. Uh, you need to get verbalizing. Start telling people, hey, call the police. Hey, tell them, tell them who I've I am. I've got on a white um, shirt with you know, blue sleeves. Uh, I've got red hair exactly, and glasses. Exactly. Tell them I'm in the back corner of the building and I've got the bad guy on the ground exactly. and I'm armed, but what, I'll put my gun down when they get here or whatever. One of the, one of the parts that is, is preparing for these sort of encounters beforehand. Uh, a family plan, mm -hmm. if you will, if you're going out um, with other people, if you're going out with your significant other or your family, um, to frequently talk about if you're carrying, if you carry a gun, uh, whether it be off duty as a police officer or as a, as a legally armed citizen, is to have the conversation with your family members, with your significant other, of what they need to do should an incident like that, like sure. that break out. And it needs to be talked about and reminded uh, fairly frequently. Sure. Um, I very often, uh, when we're going out to the mall, uh, especially like around Christmas season when it gets really busy, when we're on the drive there, hey, time to rehash the safety plan. You know, something goes down. What what are you going to do? What am I what am I wearing right now? Um, and what what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You're going to get out and you're going to go home. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're going to get in the car and you're going to drive home. Uber exists. You know, if it ends up being fine and nothing happens, uh, I'll Uber I'll back you home. There. You're yeah. going to remove yourself from the situation. You're going to call 911, inform them that I'm an off-duty law enforcement officer, that I'm armed, and that I'm wearing this, and this was the last place that you saw me, and, and advise them that I am going towards towards the gunfire that we could that we could actively hear. Um, and it's 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 the same thing for for armed citizens as sure. as they go out. To just have that little piece of preparation uh, can go a long way. Now I'll say that it can go a long way in that uh, 
that information, you can't assume that the police know that information. Right. And that's one of, that's one of the other things is that uh, with, with, especially in a larger active shooter situation. Did the dying, dispatcher pass on correct, what was needed? Correct. Uh, did they even get it? Uh, yeah. Did it go to another dispatch center who's now handling overflow calls because they got inundated with so many calls at once that it went to their overflow system. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a different county answering those 911 calls. Um, you know, was it a piece of information that was a priority to be put out at that time versus on scene traffic? Mm -hmm. And so, so it, it's important to do because you should always be set up for the greatest amount of success as possible. Sure. But you need, also need the understanding that just because that information was relayed or you think it was relayed, do not assume that the responding law enforcement officers know that for sure right uh, because it's just it's, it's not a it's not a guarantee or a gamble that you want to take so like my takeaway talking about this the thing that we pass on your point having a plan it's also being flexible and it all seems to me to come down to being aware not the range scan but being aware and then having some action for whatever stimuli comes back if the stimuli is 10 rifles pointed at you being told drop your gun hey, this freaking Glock isn't going to go off. You got it, guys, whatever. Or, or telling the people around you as the cops approach, tell them I'm right here because perhaps you can't let go of the person that's on top of you. Maybe you're not even armed. Who knows? But you need to be able to communicate. My friend Z likes to say exposure equals composure. Your point there about the, the planning if you're t there's all these guys now, as you and I know, that are passing on information. Oftentimes, the information that's being passed on is parts of a whole, like the range scan, like oh, do this. But wait, what are you actually looking for when the, the totality of it is not just look around? What are you looking for? What do you do with the information that comes in? So if you guys are taking training and people aren't talking about this stuff very seriously, I'm going to, unless you're just in a marksmanship class, which is something completely different, or a, a, a skill building class, you're at the wrong place. The guys are passing on tainted or mis, misinformation. And that's, that's really uh, like the biggest thing. What are you choosing to, to get out of the training? The other point I want to make while I've got the microphone for a second is what are we doing to keep ourselves out of those situations? Like... Drew and I were looking at some footage. I think it was Ohio at a college. It's horrible what happened. Group of guys are out at a bar. A couple of them are legally armed. For some reason, friends get into a bad fist fight. The fist fight spills out into the street in front of the bar. The campus police roll up. And the, one of the gentlemen, these guys are all liquored, is trying to break his friends up. He's a good guy. The friends are just bashing each other. And the cops are telling him, stop fighting, stop fighting. They're all so drunk that they're having a hard time listening to commands. You know, big problem right there. Well, the friends go back at it. Armed citizen, legally armed citizen, who's just trying to stop his friends, gets into the melee. His gun falls out. Cop sees the gun, draws his gun. Don't touch that gun. Drunk guy picks the gun up and gets shot three or four times, and that was the end of it. People look at it. He was just there to help his friends. Uh, what I saw was a man that was so intoxicated that he couldn't listen or walk. Him and his buddies are out brawling in the street. He drops a gun, so he's got a piece of shit holster that lets guns just fall out. Then goes to pick it up when a cop who knows nothing about what's going on and a bunch of people are fighting and now there's a gun in play, shoots him because he doesn't listen. Like, why were you even there, man? Go home. <laughs> go, go hang out in one of your garages and drink like adults if you want to be getting drunk and don't be bringing guns into the mix. And I think too often, and I don't want to speak about what happened at... Uh, the local bar the other night, but when you're in places where people are getting so drunk that they're doing stuff like that, maybe it's time to go home, you know, and not hang out. And, and that's, that's different if you're sworn to be there right. or if, you're, if you are uh, on duty in some capacity or you uh, uh, can't leave, but don't go places where that stuff's happening. That, like, right there is a, a, a big layer of, of danger taken right out of the equation. So going go for that, like looking at that situation with the don't touch the gun, don't touch the gun, your post-engagement sequence of the physical actions that you're going to take uh, if you still have your firearm out, even if, even if you don't. Um, you know, we, we always teach uh, reholster. Uh, okay, um, 
If I'm telling somebody drop the gun, drop the gun, reholstering is not dropping your gun. Um, the idea that uh, you know, I'm just going to safely put my firearm away because most of the time it sits in the safe and it's nice and unscratched and I don't want to, I don't want to drop it. Um, the moment that, that you receive that challenge, it's time to get that gun out of your hand. Uh, I can tell you, even as a plainclothes federal law enforcement officer, um, in the environment that I worked in, it was, uh, high threat and high population. And so we would always train that even as the police, when uniformed police arrived on scene, it was time to get that gun out of my hand and get on top of my firearm. Um, was that we would literally put our gun on the ground, lay on lay top on of the, so that it with, didn't our, get kicked with or... our arms out of our side so that nobody else would have access to that firearm, um, so that it was immediately underneath me and uh, so that I still had security of my mm -hmm. weapon. Uh, one of Which things, is a big issue. That, that's, the, that's the problem most guys have with that with that idea is I'm not going to just drop my gun into correct. a dangerous scene where it's getting kicked around. And yeah, because one of the things too is that even if you, if you see a law enforcement officer coming up, holstering a gun, even if they can't see you have a gun in your hand, Think about what your actions are could and be how, they, and how they could be perceived, in itself of, again, in the totality yeah. of the circumstances. Yeah. If I'm a law enforcement officer arriving on scene, I know that I'm the police coming up, especially if I'm yelling, police, police, if I'm giving some sort of verbal commands. If all I see is this, a hand go down to the waistband, do I know if a, if a gun is going away, if it's guns coming out? Is this a common action that people do, especially when receiving some sort of law enforcement challenge? Right. That's, again, the context. Is Correct. It's, this is the problem people have in the, the average folks looking at these situations. What the hell? A guy can't just reach for his belt. This is a free country. Yeah. Yes, sir, you can touch yourself anywhere you want. But when we have shooting happening yeah. and, again, the totality of the situation, Think about what you're doing. And, and, the, and the, the context yell. of the situation. Yeah, don't you know? yell fire in a movie it, it, theater. Exactly. Exactly. If, if, if one of the things that you're going to do can possibly be perceived as threatening, that's not the time that you need to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And while, again, people don't know what they don't know. Um, you know, we, we say Which is why time. we're doing this. Exactly. Which is exactly why we're doing this. Because there's somebody out there right now, right now this second, who probably has always practiced to just holster up, or in their head thought, I'm just going to holster up, who just right now realized that your reholster is the draw stroke in reverse. Mm -hmm. So if a draw is threatening, then even just reholstering in that movement to your waistband in that sort of situation could possibly be perceived as a threatening action by someone who is coming up, who is charged and has the duty to stop active killing. Or another armed citizen who's, who's coming in and, and, and go, comes into a situation and all of a sudden sees somebody going into a waistband, even if they can see the gun. You turn the corner and somebody's doing this, is it coming out or is it going in? I don't know. We, we don't yeah, know, don't we don't know, know because right. hindsight is twenty twenty, right? and we, we don't have those previous three seconds. There's no, we don't have the ability to, to go back and look at surveillance video to right. see what was going on right, right. the whole time to know that right before I came around that corner, he had engaged the bad guy and was reholstering his gun. At this point, I turned the corner, saw an arm and saw a gun at a waistband and knew that there were people who had been Probably shot. Probably some super tactical pants you know, on guess, that guy you know, as well. Guess, guess what? You know, you know what? What do I need to do now? My mind has, mm -hmm. a, has a split second to perceive that situation and make the correct choice. What would a prudent, uh, yep. rational person be doing as cops are coming in saying, police, police? Yeah. Given, the train, given the same training and experience like as, as, your, as your peers. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so, so the best thing to do is just simply not have that gun in your hand at all yeah, man. Um, you know for me the sequence of, of gun on the ground on top of the gun arms out uh, is just something that that makes sense to me uh, we, we trained it a lot uh, we were comfortable with it and and I can't really find any component of it um, that that doesn't really make any sense now I think just so people understand again context if drew the gentleman running our camera was pointing a gun at you and I and told us drop our gun and Drew was now fixated on where that gun was going and watched me put it on the ground and then me lay over it, Drew would think Mickey still has control of that weapon. So there's like 
again, context, right. like where's my hands? Am I like going to be reaching right. around my belly? And, and so with the, with, with the gun on the ground on top of it, this is more at that first level of challenge where law enforcement is arriving on scene. And again, everything is context driven. And so you can what if everything all the time. But if you've, if you've successfully dealt with, with an armed encounter, the offender is down, um, you've removed any sort of weapon source from them if you have the ability to do that, uh, and you don't feel like they're further any threat anymore, that they can't imminently do you any harm, you're looking for law enforcement, get down, get on top of that gun. Uh, just, ju just do it. Just, just be waiting. First off, one of the things is that your gun is still right there. You still have the ability to access it if you need to, and, and the situation changes. Oh, so I misunderstood. So you guys were trained as soon as you, maybe I'm wrong, but as soon as you stopped the threat in the, the airport or wherever, you would get down into this position waiting for the cavalry to arrive? So not really, not immediately. Okay. It, was, it, was, it was upon probably our first stimulus that 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 somebody else is there here um, footsteps that, that running you, in. yeah foot, footsteps running in you know you know police get on the ground um you know so, or we're on the phone hey they're on their way you know they're they're in this area right now they're, they're coming in or or if we had radios you know that were underneath our clothes you know knowing that somebody else um was was coming not immediately afterwards mm -hmm. you know because otherwise obviously in our in our instance uh, we carried handcuffs and things like that so we we could extend that sequence out to them taking that person uh, in into custody, but okay. but even then in custody, um, you know, with weapons still out, with cover and things like that, uh, immediately upon challenge from law enforcement or their presence, it was it was gunned down on top of it. Uh, police officer, police officer, police officer. Uh, I think I think as always, not to cut you off. Context rules it today. Does. It does. You know, if you're if uh, not to be gruesome, but if the person that you had to stop brains are blown all over the floor and you know he's alone. Yeah. There's no reason for you to stand like no. this. On, so perhaps no. at this point you can mm -hmm. wait for them to show up. Hey, man, he's right there. I'm the guy that yeah. stopped him. My name's Mickey. I'll comply with all your commands. What do you need me to do? Oh, you need me to get down? Or yeah. oh, you brought me a coffee? Cool. Yeah, that's exactly. what I expect. And, and exactly. I expect yeah. cops to bring me yeah. coffee. Context. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get right out. We'll get... Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, again, you know, with, with the context of that, it's just, you, you got to look at, um, in, in this instance, if, if the police are arriving and you, for some reason, still have gun in hand, that's mm -hmm. kind of the specific context of, 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 of that portion of it, is that, is, is there needs to be that, re that recognition or thought in your head in this full post-engagement sequence of, okay, the police are coming, they're arriving, I still have a gun in my hand, what am I going to do with this gun? Mm -hmm. What is my plan? What is the least threatening thing that I can do with this gun right now to ensure that there that it is it is finite in the responding officer's mind that I am not the bad guy mm -hmm. in this in this situation? Mm -hmm. um, and I think just you know just just thinking about that and thinking about the different considerations um, of all of that and all the options that you have uh, given every single different context. It is important to do. It's it's these people who don't think about gun in hand when the police arrive at all, who then don't have the ability to make that split second decision mm -hmm. when they're faced with it because they've never thought about it. And we're talking in literal split seconds mm -hmm. here for your mind to reach into that file cabinet of knowledge, training, and experience that you have and decide what is the correct thing to do right now at this moment. And, and if you've never thought about it, if you've never listened to this sort of discussion, if you've never sat around with your buddies and, and called BS on some of this stuff and interjected your thought on it, you're going to open that file and it's going to be empty. Um, and at that point, you're, you're, in, you're in panic mode a little bit because you don't have an answer immediately to what am I going to do with my gun? The police are now here. And that's how we get into these situations of good guy, bad guy, totality of the circumstances. I've got a guy who's holding a gun pointed at other people. Um, I'm going to look over. I see the police. Okay, the police are here. Oh, man, I still don't know what to do. Well, guess what? You've now just looked at the police and looked back towards what you had correctly dealt with as you attempt to process what you're going to do because your mind's never been there. Mm -hmm. So in your head, you're thinking, okay, what, what do I need to do right now so that this guy thinks that I'm, that I'm a good guy? What the responding police officer just saw was they saw an armed individual who they may or not, may not be giving verbal challenge to, who just looked at me, 
should clearly understand that I'm a police officer and has now looked back at either a down person or a group of people. Mm -hmm. Two totally different uh, sets of facts and two totally different minds. Uh, but the police can only deal with the, the totality that they're given. That, couple, that, that they're faced. couple things I want to interject to so we can touch on some of the points you brought up. I think people don't realize how fast we can process information, but how long it also takes to process information. Like, how fast can we squeeze a trigger, for example? How long is, like, what's an average reaction time for you to decide to pull the trigger while pointing a gun at somebody? Oh, right. to probably about point one four point one seven okay, seconds. Okay, so that's that's on the process. that's on the fast side of processing, right? So if you've got your gun pointed at somebody, they don't comply. It takes you a quarter of a second or less to process. Sure, if I if I'm already in my head, yeah. that this is possibly a trigger trigger right. point situation. So in that same instance, you guys or whoever in that situation is having to process the information of the police officer. So depending on that that slight little bit of a gap, quarter second or fifth of a second increments of time, that guy could already be prepping the trigger to stop you from doing whatever you're doing, but you're still in your your processing phase of, wait, what did he just say? Wait, who is he? Holy shit, I can't believe this just happened, man. I, I'm on duty tonight, and I just thought I was going to come here and hang out with girls and get a cheeseburger, and now you're shot because he was ready to go doing his job, and as you said, they've never been to that place mentally. So that's one point I think people need to take. Look at the studies of Bill Lewinsky, Fourth Science Institute, the Tempe study, which Tuller Drill came out of. Dennis Tuller and Bill Lewinsky did that study in, in the early 80s, late 70s. And then the other point that I just took away listening to you is perhaps certain people, and this is a hard pill to swallow, shouldn't inject themselves into a scenario if you don't think that you can process all of this. For example, I wouldn't walk into an operating room and be like, hey, I'm a surgeon. And they're like, you are? And I'm like, well, yeah, clearly I borrowed these scrubs out of the closet and then like just pretend to like, so if you don't have the skills, now there's a caveat to that. Like I only can do what I can do. Somebody's actively trying to kill me or my family. I can't be like, hey, I'm not a ninja, but perhaps don't be the hero in the situation if you don't think you can get to the end of that, or if you plan to be the hero, and I'm using that term loosely, if you plan to be the person to try to stop violence, spend the energy going through this stuff. Yeah, I think you know there's a difference between carrying a gun for a hobby or for a job uh, and carrying a gun because it's something that you truly feel is a tool uh, to to utilize to protect yourself, protect your family, and to protect other people. Mm -hmm. um, I think with that too is that everybody needs to draw their own line as to which of those three components they're going to and are willing to use a firearm for. Mm -hmm. um, there's some people also. There may be some people who are pretending. Uh, they're playing. They're just playing gun, uh, and it's a barbecue gun, and it's a talking point. Um, and that sure, not, we know those and guys they're not for sure. Truly, you know convinced that or, or ready to go ahead and do that. But everybody has their line between this gun is to protect me, this gun is to protect me and my family, and this gun is to protect me, my family, and other people. Um, and that, that's a sliding scale as well. Uh, you know, when, when I'm with my family, uh, things are a little bit different and, and everything is context context driven um, in that. But when you, you know, when you look at it, um, People need to have those mental conversations with themselves uh, as well. Where Where is the line that I'm willing to get, in, what to, am I willing to get involved to do? in yeah. and, and have that in their head already? And that can change every single time, uh, but, it, but it needs to be thought out beforehand, before you're in that situation, before you're in that environment. You know, I talked about you know, the rehearsals for, for you know, the mall trips and things mm -hmm. like that, especially coming into the, into the Christmas season. Um, every mall trip is different when I'm by myself, if something if something pops off, I'm gonna find the bad guy. Um, it, it's it's a, it's an oath that I took. Uh, it's the choice that I made. It's the it's the training that I sought out. That's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. um, if it's me and my significant other, she's probably gonna leave, and I'm and I'm going to work. Uh, if it's if it's me and the kid, my kid's getting out of there. That's it. She's mm -hmm. coming. She's coming with me, um, and and I'm gonna handle the business along the way in order to remove uh, my my child from the situation. 
uh, you know, add in other people, can they remove her? Everything is a sliding context of what you're willing to get involved in, mm -hmm. but you have to have thought about that before that situation occurs. Uh, you know, talk about talking about mental rehearsals in, in the police world all the time as a as a field trainer constantly telling recruits, you know, rehearse this call in your head. You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, anybody who, who puts a gun on and goes out into the public um, needs to have these thoughts in their head. Sure. You need to constantly be doing more than just going to the range, uh, shooting some rounds, going to dry fire, uh, going, going to classes. It's a constant process to ensure that you have the ability to have the most success possible if you're involved in a shooting incident. That starts with your situational awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, it then goes to your uh, your firearm skills when you decide to deploy that firearm. Uh, it goes to your medical skills. Should you have been injured or somebody else injured post firearm use? And then that, that full process of the post engagement sequence all the way to a successful transfer to law enforcement or the jurisdiction who's now going to be taking over whatever that incident was with you and your loved ones still intact and as alive as they could possibly be given given the situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The uh, quote my, my good friend Jared Reston likes to say, and people misinterpret it, is my paraphrased version is I've killed a million men a million times mm -hmm. in his head. And they're like, oh, you're a sicko. And he's like, no, not at all. To what you just said is, if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. If that happens, that's what I'm going to do. If this and this happens, this is what I'm going to do. And any, uh, from a, a basketball team to a dance, to a dance recital, to a fighter pilot, to musicians, people rehearse things both mentally uh, and physically. Our subconscious doesn't know the difference. The important thing, though, as you know, is that you got to make sure you're putting the right thing in. If it's some fantasy where you're like running through the mall saving the day and all the girls are just throwing panties at you and your wife's like, hey, wait a second. And you're like, not my fault. As you're running through the mall and you snatch a Cinnabon on your way and then like karate chop through a guy, like that's not the correct input. Well, fun. <laughs> well, I mean, look at the cinema and you throw this. I mean, that's, that's not. That's not. That's not. That's not. <laughs> but I think that that's where a lot of people have a disconnect. Well, what do I input? And this is my thought. Well, what do you want? What's the out? What is the output that you want? What is the goal? Well, my goal is to like prevail. Well, what does that look like? And you just spelled it out. First, decide what are you willing to do. For, for when we do our Illinois concealed carry classes or some of the classes we do around the country, we talk to people all the time where I'll ask if it will take a scenario that we know is legitimate that just happened and say, okay, you're now the good guy. What would you do? Well, I'd freaking draw my Glock 34 with a, a red dot on it because that's what Jim carries and I would run into battle just laying down lead. Well, wait, I just told you your wife and kids were with you. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean I, I mean, I can't not do something, so you're going to leave them totally unprotected. And you start to have these discussions. Like for me, I, uh, your, your point about your family, for me, I, I do no service to my family, who is my number one, if dad dies hmm. trying to save yeah. people he doesn't know. So, so kids can sit and say, my dad was a hero or whatever but he left us fatherless. Like, that's a trade-off you have to think about. Dad, dad did the right thing so that some other kid has a dad, but mine's gone. So that's like a pretty heavy-duty thing. Sit down and actually think about that. Am I willing to leave my children or uh, family alone or possibly get paralyzed or lose a limb or eyesight or a lot of people end up shot and they have loss of motor skills, head injuries, things like that leaves you screwed up. Are you willing to trade that? And if so, then does your training prepare you? Uh, but I think like any, any goal that we set in life, and this is a challenge for people to be very specific. I want to win, but what does winning mean? Like winning to me means coming home, not dead, not being over the mantle in a little metal box. That's winning to me. Winning to other people means something different so define what that means and then we can start to build some training parameters around that 
for example, your, your discussion about the mall, we go to the movies or a restaurant, places we go all the time, we know through that door is the alley, or through that door is the kitchen, and then the alley, or through that door of stairs that'll get me into the hallway, and, and so on and so forth. We'll go to a new place, food for thought, guys. This is common sense to some people, not to others. My sister, one of my sisters thinks I'm paranoid, but whenever I go to a new hotel, I take the stairs out. If I'm on the 11th floor, I take the stairs out. It's a good exercise, and it also makes me feel like a man when I jog past people on the stairs, but it's kind of a joke. You're deadpanning me over there. But I do. I take the stairs out, and then I find where those stairs go, and then I go to the window in the hotel, and I see, okay, if I can't go out the stairs, do I have any, and I usually ask for a low level in the hotel, but can I get out of here? Can I climb down out of this son of a gun? And if my family's with me, like if I look and it's like, I'm screwed, I'll go ask for another room. Like I don't feel comfortable if this, and buildings burn all the time. I don't think that's paranoia. I, I think people confuse preparation with, par with mm -hmm. paranoia. Uh, you know, I always say that, that preparation mitigates paranoia. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if I'm prepared to deal with a situation, um, when things start to go a little south, I'm not going to be paranoid. I'm not going to get nervous. You know, go people, right, go down. Exactly. Yeah. I already know what I'm going to do because I took that second or that minute to prepare myself. You know, it's the same thing when we look at building this post engagement sequence. Is that there? There may be that moment of paranoia that you have on that challenge of law enforcement if you haven't prepared for it, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be far more mitigated with stress and things like that if you've already okay. thought about it, if you've already practiced it, uh, if you if you've already done it. Uh, you know, people say, I'll take, you know, carry medical gear. Uh, you know, oh, you're, you're paranoid. Uh, you got all that stuff on and you got a tourniquet and all that stuff. No, I'm, I'm prepared so that I don't have to be paranoid uh, when that moment comes that I don't have the training, I don't have the equipment or the ability to deal with whatever, whatever I'm faced with. You know, so, so people say, all, you know, I hear that all the time about, about being paranoid and, and people really need to, to learn the difference between being prepared and being paranoid. I think that again comes back to our goal setting. What's the goal? And if your goal is to be like great at it, I don't want to be great at everything. Like I'm not going to be uh, the best jujitsu practitioner, boxer, knife thrower, Chinese star thrower, uh, medical applier of various techniques. And I, I'm going to like do the things that I need to win or go home. Like I can light a fire. I can skin a deer. I can change a tire. I grew up on, a, on a, like a, a rural area on a, a pseudo farm. I'm comfortable doing a lot of things, but I'm not going to invest energy in like, well, if I could repair a jet turbine, right. if I was in a crashed airplane in the Sahara, I would be the guy. Like that's not a fruitful use of my time to learn remote jet turbine repair techniques. Like that's weird. So I want to practice the things like you and I talk and you had an injury recently, mobility. So many people are so focused on, can I have a sub-second draw stroke to, hey man, maybe you just need to be able to squat down and like take another look mm -hmm. and draw your pistol. Or maybe you need to jump the fence and run away or whatever. And it's, about, it's about that realistic preparation yeah. too. You know, for, for, an armed, for an armed encounter. What, what can you realistically do in, in the context of, of surviving an, an armed encounter? And that's knowing the sequence all the way through. Uh, to give you to give you the best chance mm -hmm. for success, which is like you said earlier, survival. Yeah, not necessarily being right. And even for a police officer that's sworn to protect, your job does never dictates that you must die if you don't have to. Nope. And if somebody's pointing a gun at you, it's your right to live. It's not your you. you oh, I per, I swore an oath to get shot for no reason if I have the means to stop somebody from shooting me, even if they're doing it ignorantly and not maliciously. It just doesn't work that way. I remember one time, my uh, my dad. I was choking, and uh, perfect execution of the Heimlich maneuver. This was his Heimlich. Boom! I was like 15, man. I think he <laughs> broke my back. We're in like a checkout at like a convenience store. I was maybe 12 and I'm eating a big navel orange. You know how they're like all stringy? And I'm walking and, and I threw this chunk of orange and next thing I go, and I walk up to my pops and he's like, what's wrong with you? And, I go, and he realized I was choking, like grabbed my hair basically. Boom! And he was thicker than I am now at the time. Like about broke my back, but it got the job done. And like the, the, application wasn't intended to hurt me but like at the end of the day like 
he did what he thought was right in that little bit of time. And we, we assume, again, I've told that story and it made sense when I started to tell it, but the point was, that's all he knew how to do. You have to assume. I've met a lot of coppers from all over the country and good, awesome dudes, but their exposure to some of the training ideas that we're talking about, their, the resources of the departments, and people want to cry and say like, oh, the cities need to give them more money. There's no more money because do you want to pay more taxes? And then they're like, oh, well, don't do this. Everybody's got some special interest. It might be uh, after school program for your kids that resources go to. It might be a, a, a road building project, whatever. There's only a finite amount of money and we the people have a expected cops now to be uh, social workers, uh, uh, traffic, traffic uh, 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 directors. They, we want them to be minor car repair technicians in certain areas. We want them to be uh, uh, parents. I've got a, a guy here locally that tells me they get calls from a lady all the time that says my son won't uh, eat his breakfast. He won't get on the bus. Like people call the cops for that shit. And then you're made to go do it because like, hell, I don't want like people calling city council saying that we're not caring. Mm -hmm. And that's so far from the real idea of what law enforcement was intended for. But we, the people, asked them to do this. And then so you've got to go learn how to deal with all of these different things which makes you not good at not not good is not the word you can't really specialize so we assume that cops are like trained ninjas with guns and many of them have good skills to, to deploy a weapon but they're not spending eight hours a day training dealing with this one instance that will probably never happen and i think the general public doesn't realize that no, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think they do at, at all. You know, I, I don't think they realize that everybody's calling for more training, more training. I can tell you right now, I've been a police officer for 13 years. I'm a graduate of four different academies, including uh, United States Army Military Police School. Um, right now, you have the most highly trained law enforcement officers that there's ever been in the United States of America. Hard stop. Um, there's no, there's, there's just simply no arguing that. Uh, the, the numbers speak for themselves. Illinois now has just added more hours yet again to the basic police academy. I saw that. Uh, and so in, in all of these issues, and, and it's, a, it's a profession that is one of the few professions in the public arena, in the public sector, that changes and evolves with the society that it's that it's responsible for mm -hmm. uh, as a as a, a member of the executive branch executing the laws uh, of the united states of america of the of the states that that were sworn to uphold their statutes uh, we're kind of one of the only um, entities that public input really truly changes uh, in that when you look at now this idea of like de-escalation and, and all these sorts of things and, and whatever buzzword that you want to use right now that then gets added in as an additional layer of training that we now have to do, that everything becomes a competing interest for training. And, and the answer is always the easy answer whenever anything happens that, that in any way looks even the slightest bit improper in that one moment in time without looking at the full context of things. The answer is always, well, we need, we need smarter, better, more well-trained police officers. Where, where, where do you want them to come from? Mm -hmm. um, what do you want? Most police departments uh, require you to have a bachelor's degree uh, already. I'm not saying that, that post-second, secondary education is, is the end-all, be-all sure. of intelligence. I but, don't have any college but, degrees. But, and I'm way more intelligent right, than any police right, officer I've right, ever met. But, yeah, yeah, except for the one next to you who, who has. Uh, I also have, a, I have a, and I have a master's degree. But that doesn't make you more intelligent and we, than and me. We have. I'm just saying. I mean, I have a printer upstairs, <laughs> dude. I can print anything. <laughs> I'm printing some PhDs after this. You know, we have departments who, who, who have street-level officers who have, who have master's degrees, who have an understanding of how to learn, sure. how to adapt, um, how to do all of those things that, that secondary education gives you. Yeah. Um, on top of these police academies that you have to go to and pass um, you know with written standards and and the consistent things that we have to do as police officers to keep our certifications um, and and skills like like firearms and things like that keep getting pushed further and further down as more things are expected of right. us and so so this blanket answer you know of, of oh the police need more training first off when am I going to do that 
Um, uh, we already have all these training edits that we have to do, and we still have to go out and patrol and, and perform the actual tasks and duties of the, of the police. Um, secondly, everybody wants more training. Um, training costs money. Um, it's, it's not just make believe. You don't just say training and suddenly everybody has training. It's not. I can't just text plug a USB oh. down into <laughs> in, into your neck and all of a sudden you have the latest police update That's and, and you're and you're the, the highest update that you That'd have. Be so now. cool. You know, I mean, people have to come off the road. We have I'd to get to trainers. Yeah, um, we have to. He wasn't even a cop, but I'd want to be him. No, like, but like we could just make you, make you, make keep you going. a cop. And then, and then all the cars could be kit. We'd be like a crossover between yes. that and the and Knight Rider. We need to get on that. <laughs> you know, and so, so we look at it and everybody, everybody says they need more training, they need more training. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know where, where it's gonna where it's gonna come from. I think that's the easy answer for, for people to say as they look at the executive branch of the government that's being let down, I think, by the other branches of, of the government. I mm -hmm. think right now um, it's easy to place the blame at the hands of the police because that's who people see. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we are the face of, of statutes and laws of government. Uh, people don't look back and look at the dumb law or the loophole that was placed in by the legislature. Sure. Um, they don't look at the fact that uh, the guy that we dealt with was a seven-time felon who has been released by the judicial system. Which happens it's just, all it's, the time. It, all the time, all the time. And then it's easy to lay the blame at the feet of the executive and, and the, the uh, front people of the executive in the police uniform who, who are simply enforcing the statutes passed by the legislature mm -hmm. and who are dealing with repeat customers of the judicial system. Mm -hmm. And then the answer is always more training, more training. But at some point, there are issues that training isn't going to solve. That other parts of the government need to step up and 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 start to and start to deal with. It. And you right, know, you're not there to babysit the public. You're there to enforce a law, correct. and the judicial branch is there to deal correct. with it, punish and, them. And, and as and as government entities and things de deal with uh, uh, less resources, less money, as budgets get cut, it's easy. For those things to be passed off on the police, mm -hmm. as as social work uh, is is cut, uh, community social work, and as those budgets are slashed, um, it's it's easy then to just say, well, the police need uh, these, these crisis intervention teams. Okay, I don't have any issue with crisis intervention teams. I don't. I, I think that that they're allowing us to do things a little bit better. Um, but now we're adding a further responsibility onto the police, a further certification, a 40-hour in, in the state of Illinois, a 40-hour crisis intervention uh, certification. Uh, which that, costs that, the taxpayers that, probably three or four which, grand which per cop. Which costs money, yeah. which, which you're now using a cop to plug a hole that was fulfilled earlier by by social workers, by, by a social working budget within the county, within the municipality. Mm -hmm. And so now you're taking the police in order to fill that role. And then at the same time, when they then don't deal with another situation um, quite as well as, mm -hmm. as the public would have liked, it's, well, they need, they need more training. Now. Sure. But he just got more training to do more of something else but then he needed more training in, it's, in this. It goes back to what I was just saying about the goal. What's the goal? Yeah. And we have too many goals. My, one of my friends that's a sheriff here is um, quick to bring up a very interesting point. Uh, look at violence trends in the world. We are in a safer planet ever, all time, other than maybe when we were amoebas. Right. Like, fact hands down we are we live in a safer world ever in recorded history if you don't believe me study like just the last hundred years of what man violent crime is down yeah and despite I, what yeah, people say just, violent yeah. crime is down yeah across, look at the, across across the world it's down it is across the world it is and we don't the I, even the things like i'm talking about like what happened in china in the 1950s millions of people murdered what happened in russia it, from the 30s to the 50s, millions of people murdered. Nazi Germany and so on and so forth. The, the, the terrible uh, genocides that happened around the globe and are still happening. And it's, that stuff's all so far removed from history from what's happening now. So our local sheriff brings up a very simple point that if you look at how many cops there are now, how many citizens, how many interactions, and the stuff, staff and command looks at this stuff all the time, right? totality of how many interactions there are from writing a ticket to hey is your dad hurting you to 
Why'd you break into that house? All of those interactions across our country, it's millions of times a year. In the instance of it going sideways or a police officer doing something that the public finds questionable, it's like such a minute, and I didn't even, I don't want this podcast to become let's protect the police, but I think people need to understand that we just took an hour to discuss something that people are making judgment on in 30 seconds. For example, back to what we originally started on this post-engagement practice, the article I read, I thought about this after I read the article, the article I read this morning probably took me three minutes, top to bottom, to read it. Three minutes, and in three minutes I got I got information that came from like 10 people that were on the scene or around the scene. Then the reporters concocted their version of all of the information that came. So I had three minutes to formulate some kind of opinion. Those guys that ran in there maybe had 20 seconds, 30 seconds from the time they got out of their car and ran into a building where people were still bleeding to death, where there was still gunfire. They had 20 or 30 seconds and I had three minutes to process 10 people's version. They had 30 seconds to process what their eyes and ears took in, plus whatever fragments they were given on the way there, which was probably not a lot, because you get a bunch of chaotic people. And you guys hear this all the yeah. time, right? The dude in that moment's like the worst witness. Yeah. And so you're taking the... I've done it before where I... I, I because I drive so much, I come on car accidents so much. And years ago... My wife and sister and I were driving to go somewhere shopping in a blizzard for a freaking baby shower or something. I'm like, why are we driving in this blizzard? But I had no problem, but I watched this terrible accident. Car rolls over into the snow with some elderly people. And I told my uh, wife, you jump in the driver's seat in case somebody's going to hit us and you can move the car. Sis, call 911. I'm going to run out in the snow and see what's what. I came back about two minutes later to grab gloves because it was so cold. And they're still trying to get the phone to work, you know, like 911. And I'm like, shit, you know, like, like tell them we're right yeah. here. And just that, that person, then I thought about it, give me the freaking phone. So we're at 176 and XYZ road. Be like, if you can't dial it, you're not going to really be right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, you and can't it, manipulate a basic phone. Right. Your information is probably not going to be that great. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're in a truck and there's yeah. snow and I like on. food. Uh, uh, let me see. Hang on. Let me check the yeah. GPS. Oh, wait, I'm on the phone that has the GPS. <laughs> so we're, I think we're covering the same ground, but people don't. It's so easy to sit comfortably on your couch or wherever and dissect this information and forget that all of us have that ability to not know how to dial the phone when you have an adrenaline dump. Oh, you're the cops, you should do that. Shut up, man, you're not getting the point. We're all physical creatures. And then the last point I wanna to make to that is, like I think societally, we need to start taking responsibility for ourselves. So that was actually me one of the next things that I was gonna hit was, was this idea that that we keep expecting a lot from the police and we're answering it as much as possible. I can tell you as a board member of the Tactical Officer Association here in Illinois, we look at, at what we can supplement as far as training goes, um, the basic curriculum, and push things like like Rescue Task Force and get Rescue Task Force out there. Um, Illinois just completed the first uh, uh, Master Active Threat Training Program um, that the country has ever seen. Cool. Um, uh, the ITOA, in partnership um, with uh, entities such as uh, ILEAS, the mm -hmm. law enforcement alarm system, uh, Mavis, the fire department uh, on it, um, uh, IEMA, the emergency management agency. He knows all agency the letter came, <laughs> came together and, and made these active threat, master active threat instructors. Okay. Uh, it's, it's taken a long time. Um, a, a and I'm sure that curriculum will, be, will evolve forever. Yeah, because it's designed to evolve. Mm -hmm. it, it, it puts things in there uh, such as rapid deployment or response to active shooter, uh, self-aid, buddy aid, bandages and tourniquets, uh, active shooter response uh, as far as rescue task force, getting fire department teams in with law enforcement and getting them inside in order uh, to save as many lives as possible. So, so we continue to evolve. It's just that there's a part that's missing in what is really, really the partnership between the police and the community, it's the community's involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not talking like coming out to a coffee with a cop. Um, I'm talking things like going out and taking a stop the bleed class. Um, 
becoming a CCL holder and thinking all the way through about things like we're talking about today, this post engagement sequence and how you're going to then interact um, with, with law enforcement, um, going out and, and volunteering at things like mental health hotlines and, and things like that. In that this, this community interaction and the community expectations of the police, I think it needs to start to be a two-way street. Indeed. Um, I, I don't think um, that we can properly police and serve a society that, that only has interest in having the ability to place blame and not take any responsibility themselves for the outcome of these of these sort of incidents. You Let's know, stretch that out a little bit. The police are not the ones setting policy in communities. Correct. They're not the ones creating the education system for children. And I'm not talking about any community in particular, but anywhere, the way that there's, our societies, all of it, is created by us, we yeah. the people, I like to say. And we need to start taking ownership of and I don't, I'm, I'm not going to fixate on this, but why we have dudes showing up at bars shooting places up, how we respond to that, how are, how are we training people in our families to deal with mental health issues? Like, are we medicating people and not changing the dynamics of how they're uh, being treated? Are we raising children to grow up to be disingenuous, shitty, selfish assholes that get pissed and shoot places up and that's just one such a tiny fraction we we hear about every time it happens thus people think it's so common which is bullshit pardon me yeah yeah i, I agree and I, you know it's it, to me it's it's a partnership at the end of the day it's my responsibility to to enforce the statutes of the state of illinois and, and to protect and defend the constitution mm -hmm. um that's it um all of these other things are things that that we do as protectors of our society. Um, and I think in order to successfully do that, um, that, that we need some, some people to start to meet us in the middle mm -hmm. um, and look at how as a whole we can change some things. Uh, law enforcement isn't perfect. Um, you know, like I said, but it's just a right cross, that's just a sliver yeah. of our society, but, man. But it's help us make society better. Uh, you know, in an active shooter situation, I'm coming. My SWAT team is coming. We're going to bring medics in. We're going to bring the fire department in. We are training and evolving to do that. Um, so how about you learn how to put a tourniquet on? How about in your desk at work, you throw a cat or a soft tea tourniquet in there? Just cats. Take, take the time to... <laughs> to North American uh, Rescue. To uh, tap the medical solution, soft tea line <laughs> with the track. Can, can you tell who is sponsored by who? Um, so both both great options, both commercially available. That that if the average one's better than the other, starts to going. step up and do things like use a soft tea wide that's been proven to be just as effective as the North American Rescue Cat <laughs> Tourniquet. Um, you know, we can be more successful as a whole, and that's the end goal. Because the end goal is to prevent the loss of life. Mm -hmm. um, that's my end goal as a police officer. That's my end goal as a citizen. And we get there by doing things like uh, use of force training, uh, like uh, medical training, like uh, rescue task force, uh, active shooter rapid deployment mm -hmm. response. But then on the civilian side of that, we need people doing things like taking stop the bleed, um, taking good concealed carry courses that talk about things like a full post engagement sequence mm -hmm. that we just talked about. Uh, things like considerations of what am I going to get involved in uh, so that I don't make this situation uh, worse. Uh, things like volunteering at, at social service organizations so that we can uh, start to deal with some issues that, that get to the law enforcement level, deal with them before they get to the need for police intervention. Um, more money isn't suddenly going to appear. Right. Uh, most government entities, once you lose something, you're not, you're not going to get it back. Uh, so we as a society need to decide uh, what sort of level we want in the community that we're in and what individual role do you play in, in doing that. Instead That's of simply key, demanding as more. As a society, I can't dictate what any of my neighbors do. Right. I can't dictate what anybody does. I can control me and the output of my deeds 
And that, so that's like always where it compresses. And, and every, everybody wants more and more and more. Well, you have to look at what am I willing to do? What am I willing to give mm -hmm. in order to reach that? In order to reach that common goal? And, and I'm not asking anybody to go out, you know, and 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 get their CCL and carry a plate carrier in their car and run into the mall and and, and do the job of the police. I'm saying just, just these little things, uh, volunteering in your community, in, in a mental health office, in, in your city, county, your township, uh, so that there's the possibility that that something that may have eventually gotten to the level of police intervention and an unfortunate but necessary use of force encounter could possibly be stopped. Uh, you know, again, uh, taking a stop to bleed class, learning how to, to, to put a tourniquet on, having it, having it on you, uh, having the full conversation with your family about family protection, sure. um, whether it be in a mass violence incident, uh, in a crash, in a natural disaster. Uh, we need to start looking at our communities as a whole and not stopping and just sitting back and wondering why somebody didn't do something about this beforehand. Now, be prepared. Uh, get trained. Stay equipped. For, for what you're going out to do. Have the things that you may need uh, on you. It doesn't take much to have the basic things that you need to defend and protect yourself or your loved ones from loss of life and be willing to do whatever it is that you're willing and capable of doing. Again, you know. It sounds like an oxymoron, but I wanna make sure people understand just because you carry a gun, have the tourniquet, have the first aid kit, have all that jazz, you're having it does in in saying you're willing to do it is not the same i was in the yep. airport i might have told you this story a year or two ago another one of those scenarios where people did the old i don't know how to dial a phone my wife and i were going on a, a tropical vacation sunday mo or monday morning like 7 30 at o'hare jammed full of people elderly group of people about to board the plane they were letting them board per first and it was for a wedding party so they're going down to get married the bride's got all of her jazz everybody's happy guy in front of the line 80 ish years old slightly built face plants into the carpet and i'm sitting like right there i'm like well that's not normal like you don't just fall on your face and like count at five nobody did anything so i kind of like just took a knee in front of him and was like Hey, are you all right? And his family's like, he's fine. And they grabbed him under his arms. And I'm like, he's like, does he no normally just collapse like that? And they're holding him and he's out, man. It's like a weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. Like, we got to get to the... <laughs> and they, they are, this woman is not, not letting grandpa get on the plane. Grandpa's going. My wedding is not getting screwed up. They stand him up and he, his legs go out and he's on the ground. So I kind of roll him over into the recovery position. And I'm just looking at him for a second. And I point to the lady from the airline and I'm like call whoever you call here I don't know who it is get rescue 911 whatever and she's just looking and I all of a sudden look at my wife and I realize and there's like you know 400 people about to board the airplane they're all like a couple of people are like doing this like frozen and it was like yo like let's go come on and there was nothing for me to do I wasn't gonna put an IV in I wasn't gonna do anything but like that is and I don't like to tell these stories like ooh, I got what it takes most people don't realize how being willing but able is something completely different. And there was, again, nothing I was able to do in that scenario other than just to like bring some calm for 30 seconds until somebody called and they, they got him squared right, but, away. But being willing doesn't necessarily mean that you're running through the mall doing your reloads as you eat your Cinnabon, yes. you know, taking, taking a kite out because it was a Mumbai style attack. Right. You know, I use a hashtag all the time. I end before my company, I always end be willing. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter what that, just be willing to do something. I got you a hot tub here. What time you got to be home? I don't have to be home. You're willing? I live here now. <laughs> no, I say be willing because it's just to do something. To, mm -hmm. to, even if it's just simply calling 911, being willing to, to do something and, and prepared to do something or anything to help a situation because there are so many people right now. And, and I'll tell you right now, putting something, taking out your phone and going Instagram Live or Facebook Live, I'm, look, I'm looking at everybody directly right now. That's not doing something. That's not doing something. That's doing um, the most asinine. You're, you're, you're not a war correspondent. Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody cares. It may get likes and shares, but that's not that's not being trained, that's staying the equipped, king and, of the douches, and, and being willing. 
Um, there may be a time to record something given the context of everything, but I guarantee you that there's something else more uh, more helpful that you can that you can be doing of right course. there. Unless you're yelling world star to then put it on, <laughs> to put it on there because it's a fight that doesn't involve you. The, the, <laughs> the comment I wanted to make in regards to what you were saying is being willing though, then you have to apply action to that. You have to develop the skills and and those mean something different to as you and I become 90 year old men, willing and able become different things. And so it's like you got to do what you can with where you're at with what you have, as the famous saying goes. So what's the name of your company? Tactically Sound Training Center. Which you operate here in uh, suburban Chicago land. You guys do firearms training. You do some mm -hmm. stop the bleed training. Do. You do some work with a few firearm companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing a uh, interview for Windy City Live this week, which is I pretty am. cool. You're yeah. going to show them how to apply a tourniquet, which goes two inches above the wound site. There's a joke. There yeah, we go. Because, High because, and tight. Because no, the right. guidelines, it goes, <laughs> it goes two to three inches above the wound, which means you can go as high up on the wound as possible and be within the guidelines. <laughs> We're just messing with so, each other. Right. We do that. Um, Instagram, you're tactically sound, all spelled out. I am tactically sound, all spelled out. At yep. tactically sound, I think you have a Facebook page as well. I do. Tactically sound TC is how you get there. You can just search tactically sound or tactically sound training center. You see all my uh, all my content, all my classes are are fed through there. I got uh, got some stuff coming up for 2019 already. Uh, I've got going to close out a, a TECC uh, first care provider class. Um, and a civilian first care provider. Cool. I think. I think you know back what we were just talking about. TECC guidelines. The first one is civilian first care responder. Mm -hmm. So you know people need to realize that that if you're the first one there, you are the first responder. Right. You know people always say think police, fire, and EMS are the first responders. The first responder is the first person who who is able, willing, and equipped to actually do something. And so that's why I like I like teaching that curriculum because yeah. it specifically says civilian first care responder. Going to finish that out. Uh, here in November is my last class. Got some stuff for 2019 uh, coming already. Uh, got some good good partnerships uh, coming up for for 2019, and uh, looking looking forward to it. Super cool. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for having me on, guys. If you have questions on any of this stuff, please email training at curytrainer.com. If you're following us on YouTube, hit subscribe and like. Forward this stuff to your friends, not because it will make me more money or famous, but because it can save your life or the life of another. If you disagree, that's just too bad. I'm right, you're wrong. I just came up with that right now. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate you watching. Be well, be safe, do the right thing, be your own Calvary, and hashtag be willing. Hashtag be willing. Be willing. That actually, I think, is something that's on like a stairway in Boys Town. <laughs> Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.